Hi guys, this is Shalini and I am back to you with another video. Today the topic is endotracheal intubation. So if you like the video and the content, kindly do like, share and subscribe. Also press on the bell icon so that you are notified whenever I upload a video next. Also let me know your valuable comments in the comment box. So let's begin with today's topic. An introduction to the topic. So what is endotracheal intubation exactly? It is inserting a tube into, into the trachea which bypasses the upper airway structures and the laryngeal structures and creates an artificial airway. So there are two types in which you can intubate a patient. Either you can do an oral intubation which is the commonest type or the another way of doing an intubation is a nasal intubation. Oral intubation here the ET tube is passed through the mouth and the vocal cord and it enters into the trachea. And this is done with the help of a laryngoscope. What is the risk of doing a ET intubation, oral ET intubation as such? There can be obstruction of the airway because of biting. In cases of suspected spinal cord injury, there can be a difficulty or it's a challenge. Dislodgement of teeth, increased elevation, difficulty in swallowing are the challenges that we usually face and mouth care post intubation is also a concern. What is nasal intubation? Here the ET tube is passed blindly through the nose, nasopharynx and vocal cord and then it slips into the trachea. So in case of nasal intubation, you can expect kinking. It can be an uncomfortable experience for the patient and is also difficult for the personnel. The work of breathing is definitely greater. Suctioning is a challenge and the incidences of ventilator associated pneumonia or infection is usually accelerated when you do a endotracheal intubation which is through the nasal route. So what are the indication of doing an endotracheal intubation? One is apnea, then respiratory distress, protection of the airway from aspiration, usually patients who have GCS which is less than 8, ineffective clearance of secretions, upper airway obstruction, this can be in case of burns, tumor, bleeding or there can be any other reasons, I have just listed out 3 for you. Incre uh, raised ICP treatment or major surgery. So these are some of the indica indications that you can think where the proposed patient needs to be intubated. Equipment that is required for the intubation is as following. Laryngoscope with the blades, endotracheal tube, amber bag or vein circuit, oxygen source with tubing, suction apparatus with the tubing, suction catheter, adhesive ET tie, McGill's forceps, stillet, disposable syringe, example 10 ml syringe, oral airway, cuff manometer, lubricant jelly, intubation pillow and definitely personal protective equipment which will include gloves, mask, apron and goggles. So this slide I have basically tried to classify the equipments based on the requirement. So for oxygenation you will need a BMB device also the oxygen tubings and the oxygen source. Ventilation you will need airways. Also, you have to think of emergency cricothyroidotomy and also or transtracheal jet device or LMA, what you call as the laryngeal mask airway. Intubation, you will need the necessary laryngoscopes, blades, tracheal tubes and also guide wires for the intubation, adhesives. Suction, Yonkers catheter, usually when you want to do an intubation, oral suctioning is also a concern, so Yonkers catheter. The monitor that you have connected should have ETCO2 which is confirming the placement of the tube. Drugs, especially in case of RSI, that is rapid sequence intubation, you will need some drugs basically to paralyze, also to increase the contractility of the heart and decrease the secretions. So, drugs is also one concern and miscellaneous, that is syringes, needles, stop box and IV connected tubes. Parts of the endotracheal tube, definitely this all of you would know, but this I have just included to make it more comprehensive. So, parts of the endotracheal tube, you have the 15 mm connector, this is connected to the oxygen source or to the ventilator, you have the pilot balloon, this is the cuff inflation line, this is the inflated cuff, so you use the pilot balloon to inflate this cuff. You have the bevel, the Murphy's eye and also what is not mentioned here is a radio opaque line, so another way of confirming the placement of the tube. These are the size of the endotracheal tubes that, would, that you would need, this is classified based on the age groups. First so of all, neonates less than 1 kg is 2.5, neonates 1 to 3 kg is 3 to 4, 
2 to 12 years is 4.5 plus age divided by 4. Adult female is 7 to 8 and male is 8 to 9. In my practical experience, I have seen that usually for pediatrics, what we do is 4 plus age divided by 4. That's how we calculate. And for female, it's usually 7, mostly 7 and 7.5 in some cases. An adult male is usually 7.5 in most of the cases and what I have seen is also 8. But this is the classification that most of our reference books would suggest. The next is the Malampatti classification. This is one very important thing that all of us should know. This will predict the ease of an intubation. So just assuming that you will know the anatomy of the mouth, but just uh, giving you a brief on that also. So this is the hard palate. Beyond what you see is a soft palate. This is uvula and on the lateral sides you have the tonsils. So it's with this basic idea, if you look at this picture, in class 1, you can completely see the soft palate. So, this dark brown area, you can completely see. So, that is class 1. If you can completely see the soft palate, then it is easy intubation, class 1. Class 2 is you can visualize the uh, uvula. Class 3 is where you can only see the base of the uvula. The soft palate is not very visible, but you can still see. Class 4 is the soft palate is not visible at all. So, that is a very difficult intubation. So, this is a spectrum or range at which you can see Malampatti score which tells you how easy or how difficult is going to be your intubation. It correlates the tongue size to your pharyngeal size. Preparation for endotracheal intubation. So, this is not just for intubation, but for any procedure when you look at these are the four domains at which you should prepare. So, first thing is the environmental preparation. You should make sure that you provide privacy to the patient, however critically ill the patient is. Probably the patient is not able to see or understand. But privacy is most important. Floors has to be swept and mopped, adequate lightning, aseptic technique or good environment, aseptic environment in which you are going to perform the procedure. Patient, you should ensure the comfort of the patient, consent from the patient. Now, probably in case of critically ill patients where you are not able to gain consent from the patient, patient is not able to take decisions or determine for himself, probably you can get the consent from the relative or the guardian. Also positioning the patient. So, this is patient preparation. Equipment preparation, again collecting of all the equipments which I have already mentioned and personal preparation where you wash your hands and don on adequate personal protective equipments. So, that is preparation. So, let us start with the steps of uh, endotracheal intubation. I have already mentioned about position. So, what kind of position will you want to maintain for a patient who is proposed for an intubation? It is called as a sniffing position. Now, what is the need of keeping an intubation pillow? Why should we elevate or uh, extend the neck? So, all of that is very clear in this picture. So, if you look at the picture A, you see the OA that is the oral axis. You have PA that is a pharyngeal axis. LA that is a laryngeal axis. When you place an intubation pillow under the occiput, what happens is the pharyngeal and the laryngeal axis will converge. And when you extend the neck a little bit more, what happens is the oral pharyngeal laryngeal ax axis will converge and you get a straight line where it becomes easy for the personnel to intubate. But if you are not able to place a pillow and you just try to extend, what happens is there is no converging of the oral pharyngeal and laryngeal axis and then it becomes difficult for the personnel to intubate. So, this is sniffing position which has to be maintained for a ET intubation. The next thing that you do is you check the ET tube, inflate and deflate the cup and place the stillets inside the tube and apply jelly. So, what happens is even when you are taking new catheters, there are chances that they, have, they can be cuff leak. So, it is always better to inflate and deflate and check before you intubate whether there is any cuff leak. That is first thing. And then you place this guide wire which is otherwise called a stillet inside the endotracheal tube and then you apply jelly all over. You have checked the cuff and the ET tube. Next thing that you have to check, very important is you have to check the functionality of the laryngoscope. So, you have to check whether the blade slides properly into the handle. Also check whether the lighting is good. So, there is there will be a light here which is good or not. Uh, just to mention or brief you about the types of blades that you usually have. First thing is the Macintosh blade which we usually commonly use for the adult population and Miller blades. These are straight blades which is used for the pediatric groups. Next step is pre-oxygenate or hyper-oxygenate the patient either using an ambu bag or Bain circuit. 
So hyperoxygenation or pre-oxygenation is one very important or critical tenet as far as airway management techniques is concerned. And what you do is you provide a very tight seal or CE technique so that the amount of oxygen that you want or is desirable is definitely delivered to the patient and the alveolar oxygen concentration is improved. The concept of pre-oxygenation. So why is it really important for us to pre-oxygenate our patients or hyperoxygenate our patients before intubation? And this becomes more critical in case of rapid sequence intubation. Now in this particular picture, if you see FRC, that is a functional, re a functional residual capacity. This is the amount of air which is left back inside your lungs or the reservoir of air inside the lungs post a passive expiration. And VT is the tidal volume that is the amount of air that will freely move in and out of your lungs during an inspiration or an expiration. So the thing that I want to tell you is for a patient who has rendered apneic, there is a finite time period before which the arterial oxyhemoglobin level would decrease. What I want to tell you is for example, for a patient who has got apnea, you are going to give 100% of oxygen before you intubate. Then before the next apnea, you have at least 10 minutes because you have hyperoxygenated with 100% of a, uh, FiO2. But for a patient whom you have given just the room air, pre-oxygenated with 25 1% of FiO2, you just have 2 minutes before the next period of apnea. So pre-oxygenating or hyperoxygenating the patient with 100% is always good for a critically ill patient. And definitely for a patient in RSI, that is rapid sequence intubation, it can improve the alveolar oxygen concentration of the patient. So why a back mask device like I told you why pre-oxygenation so that is to improve the alveolar oxygen concentration and to make sure that before the patient has got the next apnea you have some time to do your intubation. Similarly in case of bag mask device there is a reason why you want to use a BMV device. In case of nasal prongs if you are giving 2 liters you are giving actually 28 percentage of FiO2 the achievable FiO2 is 28 percentage. 6 liters. 44% of oxygenation is given to the patient. Simple face mask 5 to 6 liters is 44%. 7 to 8 is 60%. 6 liters with a BMB device is 60%. 10 liters is 80% and 50 liters is 90%. So if you look at this picture, a BMB device is usually good in providing higher rate of inspired oxygen for the patient. That is the reason why we use bag mask device, especially in cases where you want to do airway management for critically ill patients. After you have checked the ET tube for its functionality and the laryngoscope also for the functioning of the equipment, you have pre-oxygenated the patient. Then the next thing that you have to think of is inserting the laryngoscope. So what you do is you insert the laryngoscope into the right angle of the mouth the blade of the scope into the right angle of the mouth and you slide the scope towards the center and after you uh, slide the scope towards the center you approach the base of the tongue and engage the valicula so what you are trying to do is this is above the epiglottis there is a small depression you try to en engage the blade of the scope into the depression called as the valicula so that's how you insert the laryngoscope and this is in case of a curved blade that is the macintosh blade now what do we do in case of a Miller blade? Miller blade are the straight blades. So in case of Miller blades in pediatric age groups what you do is you don't engage the valicula. What it does is the blade goes and sits beyond or beneath the epiglottis. So it covers the whole area. Then you get a straight way where you can insert the endotracheal tube. Next is suctioning the oral cavity. So I have already done videos on tracheostomy and suctioning where I have mentioned how do you suction. You can always refer that but just a word here suction the oral cavity oral cavity what we use is usually yonkers suction you suction and if there is any solid particles or any dislodged teeth or something you can always use mcgill's forceps so suctioning is also one very important thing this is basically to prevent aspiration of gastric contents if there is any vomitus and also aspiration of secretions in case of patients who have excessive secretions the next step in intubation is you insert the et tube so now I have inserted the laryngoscope, I can, I have engaged the valicula, I can clearly see the trachea, I insert the ET tube. Now what another one concept that you have to remember is application of cricoid pressure, especially in case of rapid sequence intubation. So what you do is uh, beyond or beneath your thyroid cartilage is your cricoid cartilage. You apply a small pressure onto your cricoid cartilage in a way 
that you are able to obstruct the esophagus so why we do this is basically you want to prevent regurgitation of gastric contents or prevent aspiration is why you provide required pressure and then the path is straight for the ET tube to get inside. So now the ET tube is in place you remove the stillet that is the guide wire that was sitting inside and you connect the ET tube to the ambu bag. Once the ET tube is in place oh, the way of checking whether the tube placement is right or not is post intubation auscultation where you will check for bilateral airway entry and also in the gastric area just to rule out that there is no esophageal or there is no gastric intubation. So auscultation is the first thing. The gold standard of confirming whether the, your tracheal tube is inside the trachea is ETCO2 that is the end tidal carbon dioxide. So the normal is 35 to 45. If it is beyond that it just means the amount of carbon dioxide is more. But if it is less if the end tidal CO2 is less then you always have to think of a wrong placement of the tube. So that is the clinical suspicion then. So once the tube is in place you have confirmed the placement of the tube then what you have to do is to inflate the tube just to make sure that there is no dislodgement of the tube. So you inflate the tube let us say with 10 ml of air and then you connect the ET tube to the mechanical ventilator and another thing that you see here is the closed tracheal suctioning circuit and you apply the adhesives and also make sure that it is secure. So that is another step. So once the tube is in place and you have connected it to the ventilator and the patient is stabilized immediately check the cuff pressure. So this is the degree to which you have inflated the cuff. If for example the cuff is over inflated there are chances that it can cause some amount of necrosis and irritation to the particular area to the particular tracheal area and if this area is under inflated higher chances of dislodging of the tube. So you have to continuously maintain the pressure between 20 to 25 mm of Hg. This is one of the last steps in the intubation process and definitely cannot be underrated. If you have heard my uh, first few slides I was talking about airway obstruction because of biting of the tube. So suppose the patient is not adequately sedated and is very uncooperative definitely there are chances that there will be obstruction of the tube due to biting. So one way where you can rule this out is by oropharyngeal airway. So you can insert a oropharyngeal airway or another alternative strategy is putting a bite block. So either of these ways you can prevent biting of the tube and obstruction of the airway in that manner. A quick recap on today's topic that is endotracheal intubation. So the first thing that you do is pre-oxygenate the patient with 100% oxygen. Then suctioning if required, assist with intubation, check the placement of the tube and I was, as I was telling you ETCO2 is the gold standard. Inflate the ET tube cuff, also make sure you monitor the cough pressure so that you know whether the cuff is over inflated or under inflated. Apply the oropharyngeal airway and secure the tube and then connect the patient to BMB device or the ventilator. So nursing management also very important some of the things that you should remember maintain the ET tube placement maintaining correct placement and patency is the first thing. Maintaining proper cuff inflation that is you use a cuff manometer to check whether the inflation or the pressure is proper. Monitoring the oxygenation and the ventilation for the patient providing oral care very important because we have most of the cases ending up with ventilator associated pneumonia and also maintaining the skin integrity for these patients. Fostering comfort and communication and prevention of complications and also infections. So thank you. I hope that today's video was useful to each of you. If there is any doubts, comments or clarifications, please leave back in the comment box. Also let me know your valuable feedback. Otherwise, thank you and have a great day.